my name is John Schinnerer. I got really excited about the synchronicity between neuroscience research, neuropsychology, and what how sociocracy is designed and operates. So this is going to be a fairly fast and specific presentation introduction to some of the aspects of that that I found the most striking. Um, and most of this comes from actually a seminar I'm in with uh, a number of people who have more experience with this, including uh, some who've written a book on it. And so there'll be a few references and resources in my slides, uh, which will be available afterwards as well. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and just launch into this. <clears throat> um, and I'm going to try and go through pretty quickly so we'll have some time for questions or reflections after the purely presentation part. So bear with me just a minute. Okay, should be seeing my screen. And here we go. So i um, calling this feeling safe and brave because that's a phrase I'm borrowing from one of the people I got a lot of this from. And um, we're looking at processes, methods, and structures from sociocracy that support leading bravely, leading boldly, by creating a safer context to do that in. Safer, in this case, doesn't mean comfortable. It means safer. So more safe than some other context. But not comfortable because if we're too comfortable, we tend to get complacent and everything's just fine the way it is and why change anything. So it's, it's safe enough to be braver than we were before. Um, just to set a little framework, sociocracy, when I use that word in this presentation, means primarily the sociocratic circle method implementation of sociocracy. And I need to point out that the illustrations here that you'll see some real nice illustrations these are copyright, uh, Mary Jolinas and David Sibbett, all rights reserved. So you are not free to use them elsewhere at this point without permission from them. Um, so uh, let's get into it here. Um, safety and threats, what, how, how do people, how do human beings conceive of safety? How do we experience being safe and what threatens that? And again, this, uh, information is based on the last couple decades of research in neuroscience and neuropsychology and how we, how our bodies and our brains react in certain ways. And nowadays we have this amazing technology where we can actually watch what parts of the brain are activated in certain experiences. So um, <clears throat> a, a lot of you will recognize things here that you know this works you know this is how you react you know this is how people react uh, most of the time what we have now is for people who want science to agree with those experiences we actually have research that says yeah we can actually see this happening in the brain in the nervous system uh, when people are in a machine having these experiences okay so um, all in all we like things to be pretty certain and predictable and so one of the challenges we face when we want to collaborate, because this is about collaboration, is that collaboration is uncertain and unpredictable. We, first of all, we're collaborating with other people and people can be uncertain and unpredictable. And collaboration is, um, you know, we're trying to create something we don't know quite what it is with other people and that's unpredictable. Um, our survival and safety are connected to relating with others because we're social beings. And so our self-identity and our worldview, how we think the world is, that's part of what's tied into uh, relating with others. And uh, most fundamentally, when we are having interactions with other people, we're trying to collaborate on something. If we're interrupted, if we're ignored, if we're dismissed, if we're criticized, those are perceived as threats to our safety, to our identity. So that can put us into survival types of behavior because we think we're gonna get cut off from that connection. We're gonna be isolated. Um, we may think we're actually gonna become the other, the unknown, the unsafe other person that, that we also fear ourselves. 
And so in terms of brain activity, we start to respond from our amygdala, which is our emotional response center, and our brain stem. The, the behaviors, the scope of behaviors there is limited. It tends to be these things we are familiar with, like freezing or fighting, collapsing, giving up, running away, uh, attachment cry, which is the infant crying out for, for the adult to come and, and help them, support them, make them safe. So these kind of responses typically don't support collaboration. Okay, so here's a lovely drawing by David Sibbett um, illustrating a model called the SCARF model. This is from David Rock uh, from his book, Your Brain at Work, uh, which is a great resource. The SCARF is um, some foundations of our being that, that may be threatened. So there's status which he defines as our worldview and our self-identity, how we see ourselves in the world. Uh, certainty, which you touched on, right? We, we like certainty and predictability. Autonomy, meaning are we able to act for ourselves on our own behalf or are we being controlled or forced to do things by other people or circumstances? Relatedness also touched on our connection with other people is very important and uh, what he calls fairness. It's what's the social norms around who gets what and how much and when and why. So mostly I'm going to focus on this, on this certainty and relatedness and a little bit the status pieces. So threats to those can be a number of things. Like I said, threats to certainty is a little bit built into collaboration. It's an uncertain process. And then relatedness may be challenged because people are challenging our thinking, our ideas, how we see the world. So when one of those factors is threatened, what happens in our brain? Well, on the left side, there is some of the primary impacts. One thing is that we become more self-absorbed, self-centered, literally. We lose awareness of other people, the larger picture. We may forget information that we knew seconds ago that would help us think more clearly, it's gone, it's out of our mind, as it were. We'll find ourselves reacting automatically, meaning, for example, you kind of see yourself or hear yourself saying things, and part of you is thinking, oh my God, why am I saying that? I don't want to say that, but it's already come out of your mouth, or you may react physically in ways that you didn't consciously want to. Uh, a third one is the emotional contagiousness of our feelings. Um, in other words, we can catch, we can be infected by the feelings other people are having in, in a group, in a room, in a space together. Um, if you notice down at the bottom of the drawing in red, there's fear and anger. Uh, it's important to understand that fear and anger are the most contagious feelings. In other words, we more easily are affected or infected by someone else's fear and anger, or we more easily infect others with our own fear and anger. Def much more um, contagious feelings than say happiness or joy or even than sadness. And then uh, fourth one is what's called cognitive hijacking, or in some literature it's called amygdala hijacking. And um, that is a number of things happen which we'll look at on the next slide here. So cognitive hijacking takes us into uh, four primary things that happen. One is called confirmation bias. This is, um, and some of these you may be familiar with have been in the news a lot lately because of social media, uh, effects of social media and what's called filter bubbles <clears throat> where algorithms in social media just feed us more of what we already want instead of giving us other information, different information. Confirmation bias is where we ourselves pretty much pay attention to things that agree with us and do our best to ignore things that don't agree with us information. <clears throat> and this is an unconscious thing. We're not necessarily aware that it's happening. A bit of a parallel that we consciously will do is called motivated reasoning on the upper right. Uh, and this basically means we know what we want to get. 
our broader perspective, our deeper thinking has been hijacked. It's not happening anymore. We're just trying to stay safe. And so we will argue and reason, or so we claim, to support our point of view, to support whatever it is uh, we want to believe. Uh, one way to talk about this is lawyer compared to learner. Learner is open to all perspectives and wants whatever they can gain from those different perspectives. The lawyer has a certain perspective that they need to prove. You know, my client is innocent or my client is guilty. And everything I'm gonna say is trying to prove that. Um, another effect is, is an increase in cognitive dissonance, meaning if we're calm and clear and thoughtful, we may be able to hold contradictory ideas at the same time. You know, as the diagram says, thought A, that could be true. Thought B, that could be true also. Um, when we get cognitively hijacked, we lose our ability to do that and we end up wanting one thing to be right and everything else to be wrong because again it helps us feel safer and less threatened and then a fourth category um, which again is a very big factor in a lot of polit politics and political campaigning and lobbying it's called loss aversion and it basically this is a our brain our mind our body we experience the pain of loss more sharply or strongly than the potential of gaining something. This is especially true when it hasn't actually happened yet. So you notice that in a lot of um, political arguments over who to vote for or what laws to make or what laws to take away, we are bombarded with all the information about what we will lose if we do this thing or don't do that thing. And that's because people putting out that information know that we're much more afraid of losing something we have than we are eager to get something that we don't have. And, and that even though it might be better, what we might gain might be better, we are more drawn to avoiding loss. Okay, so there's a quick review of what can happen when the threats come in and we get out of clear thinking and, and broad thinking and into cognitive hijacking. So what do we do, what can we do about this and how does sociocracy relate? Um, so the benefits of creating a safer context is basically less of all those things happen. Um, we're more willing or more brave to speak up if we feel safer. We're much more able to collaborate with other people when we're not in a reactive state we are less likely to get into survival responses, you know, to want to run away or to want to fight or to give up. And we are less likely to be living, experiencing a lot of fear and anger. If we're not experiencing fear and anger, we're less likely to infect other people with it. And so we're going to get better outcomes when we have complex situations or emotionally challenging issues. We get a better reasoning we get more big picture holistic thinking because we have better connection in our brain to, to what's called the executive function and the prefrontal cortex. That's what gives us clearer thinking and more big picture holistic thinking. And so we're just less likely to be cognitively hijacked and experience those sort of anti-collaboration behaviors that, that happen when we're hijacked. So same slide, new tagline, sociocracy reduces these threats and so it reduces the impacts. How does that happen? Well, some of us are more familiar than others with all the systems and processes, but here's a quick overview. So if we go back to, you know, some of the basic things that we experience as threats and that trigger safety or survival behavior, we use rounds for discussion and conversation. So uh, there's an opportunity for everyone to be heard. It's built into how we do this is that we're far less likely to be ignored or dismissed or interrupted, right? In rounds, we don't interrupt each other. We don't ignore or dismiss each other. And um, we make policy decisions by consent. Thanks, Gary. 
So we're um, seeking objections from those affected. In other words, we're being asked, how does this affect you? We're being included, which is, you know, there's no threat there. It's, it's, a, it's a good feeling. It's a beneficial feeling. We listen to each other's questions and reactions, which includes thoughts, feelings, ideas, and perspectives. This means that we're supported in our worldview, in our sense of self, in our self-identity. Even if we don't always agree with each other, we make space for it rather than immediately challenging it. <clears throat> we don't criticize each other as individuals. We focus on the ideas and the arguments and not on the people who have them. So if I am critical of a proposal, I make it about the proposal, not about the person who brought the proposal. Because once it's on the table, it's all of our job to work on it. And we generate equivalence with the structures and processes that we use. Right? So this touches back on that piece of fairness in the SCARF model, the F is fairness. And so our experience of fairness is increased rather than decreased. Um, and so I just as an open question or for reflection after I wrap up here, what other ways can you think of that the processes, structures, methods of sociocracy reduces the threats that might put us in uncollaborative behavior? Um, so just to, <clears throat> some quick parallels, some generalizations. Of course, sociocracy isn't, we're not the only ones thinking about this. So this drawing is from a book by Mary Jolinas um, called Talk Matters. And if you look at these, what she calls six indispensable communication skills, you'll recognize that they're all in one way or another incorporated in the sociocratic circle method, as well as other approaches we might use. The idea of listening attentively, asking open-ended questions and not moving too quickly to solutions. So, you know, we're asking those questions when we're processing the proposal or working to generate a proposal. Speaking in an inclusive way, in other words, you know, okay, well, here's how I see this. And then we hear how other people see it. We don't say, this is the way you need to see it, which is an exclusive way. And the embodied, speaking in an embodied way is, um, just means bringing in your embodied experience. For example, I feel scared about speaking up because I disagree with this other person. Ex acknowledging your own embodied experience. Uh, Last couple, summarizing and synthesizing. This is what you know the facilitator might do as proposals being generated or during an election. And of course, the process observations and process suggestions, we're very much paying attention to the processes we use, how they're working for us, and how to make them better when we're working sociocratically. So this is all very aligned with other people who've really looked into the neuroscience and how to interact in ways that minimize or remove threats. Okay, last thing is what else helps? Contemplative practices. This is the most researched aspect of neuroscience and neuropsychology. Most all forms of mindfulness and meditation. And here's just a list of benefits, which include less reactivity, noticing emotions sooner, better attention and focus, uh, reduced unconscious bias, we're more aware of our actual bias, and our sense of self becomes more stable, so it's less easily threatened. So, you know, one thing to do that definitely is shown to work is any kind of contemplative practice. And a few clothing th closing thoughts. Um, the first one is actually paraphrased from Mary. Um, and she suggested that, you know, long ago, survival depended primarily on interacting, collaborating with people that we perceived as being like us. And in the world as it is now, that may have changed and survival may depend more on interacting and collaborating with people who we perceive as not like us. But they're still who we're here with. Um, and in general, the idea that as leaders in sociocracy and whatever else we do with that, we need to take responsibility for our internal state and our external actions. Like, how do we 
deal with this? How do we become less reactive and more collaborative and support others in doing that? Okay, so that's the end of the presentation part. Yeah, I will. So, okay, a couple of questions Pierre asks, is it possible to download the presentation? Um, yeah, I will make that available. And of course you can watch the video again, but uh, okay. So Vero says great connection between the more abstract socio concepts terms and the human psychology. Um, let me just find somebody I don't know at all and see if they have any questions or comments. Um, Karen Gimning, anything you wanna toss, on, toss in here? Sure. I'm, one of my backgrounds is that I work with Imago Relationships, and I'm just so struck by how aligned this all is with the Imago Relationships, and in particular with the mirroring element that is used with Imago Relationships. And I think the more I look at the, the two, sociocracy and Imago, and how aligned they are in values, the more integrating some of those Imago pieces around mirroring and validation and empathy seems like they could potentially be really powerful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm a little bit familiar with Imago and everything I know in human psychology and relating is so well supported by the neuroscience piece. Okay, I have a request from uh, in the chat from Pascal. May I comment, Pascal? Go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot. That was a great presentation. Um, I was uh, wanting just to share one thing because I'm in France and we, uh, in our meetings, we have something that we put in the center. And it was relating a lot to what you were saying about uh, speaking to the issue and not uh, judging the other, etc. And actually when we're speaking, especially if it's there are tensions, uh, is to speak to what is in the center of the circle. So you're actually putting your 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 words into <clears throat> something that contains, and the whole group can relate to this container. So I think it relates really well to a lot of what you said. I would like to know what you think about it. Nice. We've got somebody. Uh, yes, nice. Thank you. Um, I like that idea. I would encourage people to give that a try. Uh, a focus point that is not an individual, but the, represents the circle. Um, Pete, Pete Dignan uh, says, asks, do you think creating the safety is precursor to implementing sociocracy or concurrent? Um, I wish we had the luxury of making it a precursor. Uh, I would say in our culture, we need to work all these angles. Um, I wouldn't wait um, to work with sociocracy. And I think sociocracy provides some of that container. Diana also asked me, you know, can you take one of the six things from Mary's, from the slide from Mary's book and show how it's part of the sociocratic circle method. So just the first one of listening attentively, we create a context that makes it more likely that we'll listen attentively because we use rounds as our basic procedure and one person is speaking and everyone else is hopefully listening or at least they're not talking or interrupting. Um, so the, what we do in sociocratic processes contributes directly to creating some of that safety and there's other things we can bring in. Um, so I think we have about two minutes. Um, let me find someone else. I don't know at all and see if they want to say anything. How about, uh, let's see, there's a number of people I can't see. Um, well, Franz, I'm curious, anything to say, Franz? Good to see you in person. I know your name, but have not seen you. Uh, you're muted if you want to speak. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I have, don't have anything to add just now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Good. <laughs> presentation. It's very interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Anyone else? Last thoughts? Just wave your hand or unmute yourself. Um, Rita, anything? Uh, yes, um, just to say thank you. Um, it will help me to understand a little bit more what runs in, in our circles and maybe to make uh, a stop and have a look what's going on. Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, and a couple more comments. Um, uh, it confirms my own experience of how sociocracy is challenging, too challenging for some people if these people refuse unconsciously or resist self-development. Um, Mukunda, contributing to your earlier question, um, oops, that just, hang on. <laughs> it seems that established outer circle domains can help prevent hijacking. Yeah, that's definitely a possibility. I would agree with that. Um, Vero says, interesting idea of talking to a container or the object. It says, in Agile, you have this practice of let the board do the talking. And that's when you're, when you're using a whiteboard or a visual media um, to manage a conversation or a project. Um, and that's also the, the illustrations here by David Sibbett are done in a style called visual facilitation, which is another really good thing to look into making it visual. Okay, I believe we are out of time for this one. We need to give a couple minutes for the next person to come in. I'm gonna go to the boardroom and we'll get a breakout uh, and see what else people wanna talk about. Have a great rest of the sessions. Hope to see you again somewhere. <laughs>